Cyrodiil, the starry heart of Nern, the seat of sundered kings, a land of valleys and rivers resting firmly in the centre of the grand continent we call Tamriel. At times it was a land of dense jungles, a river-dependent society, but as is the way of things in the Elder Scrolls series, things can change, especially when it is the gods that are playing with vast powers, and as a result, we end up with the Cyrodiil you may be most familiar with from your adventures as the hero of Kavach. Cyrodiil has been the seat of power for thousands of years, the imperial province. Three grand empires have been instructed by the lines of emperors who sat on the ruby throne, protected within the walls of the imperial city. But the term imperial is a bit of a misnomer. For sure, the natives of Cyrodiil come from the imperial province, but the word imperial doesn't completely do justice to the diverse peoples that make up Cyrodiil. You may be familiar with the Nedic peoples, originally slaves to their Aelid overlords until Alicia set them free and created an empire. Well, over time, the Nedes culture evolved, depending on their geographical locations and proximity to other nations. Enter the Colovians and the Nibbanese. The Nibbanese hail from the eastern parts of Cyrodiil, places such as Leowen, Breville, and Chadenhall, with great influence on the imperial city, magical aristocracies, cults, all that kind of stuff. But we aren't here to talk about the Nibbanese. Today, we are talking about the sensible, straightforward, rugged, warlike Colovians of western Cyrodiil, the lands of Anvil, Kavach, Skingrad, and Coral. But how were the Colovians not simply culturally absorbed by the Empire? Well, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and today I'm going to tell you the story of Rizlav Larek and how he essentially founded the Federation of Colovian Kingdoms, which would become known as the Colovian Estates, an autonomous bulwark against the fanatical regime of the Elysian Order. It was this alliance that allowed them to maintain their cultural values for thousands of years, a fierce independence that became synonymous with the Colovian people. So this story begins way back, many thousands of years ago in the First Era, and you will need some critical background information before we get to Rizlav himself. In the year 243 of the First Era, the White Gold Tower falls into the hands of Alicia and her rebellion. The Elysian Empire, the first Cyrodiilic Empire, is formed. What would have been considered a Golden Age begins and the Empire flourishes. However, by the year 361, the Empire is essentially co-opted by the Elysian Order. The Elysian Order was a monotheistic religious order that rose from the teachings of the Prophet Maruk. By this year, the doctrines of this religion were enforced by law. This fanatical religion would ultimately define the Empire until its collapse. Fast forward to the year 448 of the First Era, and our hero, Rizlav Larek, is born to Queen Lynada and King Morus of Skingrad, the seat of power in the West Weald. Rizlav was their eighth child and fourth son. Unfortunately, Queen Lynada would die shortly after his birth. Now, the history books make little mention of Rizlav for most of his early life. As it stands, he functioned as a spare prince, one of the king's many heirs. Throughout history, it is very rare that one such as Rizlav would become so notable. As opposed to the statecraft, etiquette, and religious instruction that were drilled into the minds of the more civilized Nebanese, Rizlav would have been primarily instructed in the ways of hunting and battle as a true Colovian prince. The first but brief reference to the young lad Rizlav was as part of the roles of honor during the coronation of Emperor Gorius on the 23rd of Sun's Dawn, year 461. He would have only been about 13 years old at the time. At this grand event, he would have been privy to an experience unlike any other, the gathering of some of the world's most legendary figures, Dalok Bray, the Beast of Anaquina, Hyorik the White, the High King of Skyrim, as well as his son Hoag Mercula, even Indoral Nerevar of the Kaima and Dumak Dwarf King of the Dwemer, were there representing the First Council of Resdane, despite the anti-Elven sentiment. But once again, Rizlav disappears from the history books, being a figure of unimportance until he re-emerges again in the year 472. You see, Skingrad and Kovach had often been at odds, skirmishing over border territories, petty battles and threats were commonplace. 
But by this year 472, peace between the two kings, King Justinius of Kvatch and King Morris of Skingrad, was made through the marriage of Rislav Larik at age 24 to Belen, the daughter of Justinius. Rislav would remain at the court of Kvatch with his dear wife until grave news reached his ears in the year 478 of the First Era. In this year, at age 30, he received the terrible news of his family's demise. A great plague had swept through Colovian Cyrodiil, taking the life of the entire Skingrad royal family present at the time, including the King Morris. The only two people of the royal family outside the dead were Rislav Larik in the court of Kvatch and Morris's second son, Dorald. I'll refer directly from the source, Rislav the Righteous by Sinjin, to give you an apt description of Dorald. He was slightly simple-minded and evidently very pious. All the chroniclers spoke of his sweetness and decency, how he saw a vision in his early years that brought him, with his father's blessing, from Skingrad to the imperial city and the priesthood. The priesthood of Maruk, of course, saw no difference between spiritual and political matters. It was the religion of the Elysian Empire, and it taught that to resist the emperor was to resist the gods. Given that, it is scarcely a surprise what Doral did when he became king of the independent kingdom of Skingrad. His first edict, on his very first day, was to cede the kingdom to the empire. This was a decision that shocked the kingdoms of Clovia, and it was a decision that would not go unpunished. Naturally, Rislav Larek was furious and he rode to Skingrad with his wife and two dozen of his father-in-law's cavalry. Any guards that were sent to fight him were ultimately defeated by superior tactics, as the embellished stories say, but the truth of the matter is that not a single guard took arms against Rislav, for they resented King Dorald for giving Skingrad up to the Elysian Empire. The confrontation between Dorald and Rislav went down in the courtyard where they grew up together. There were no accusations of treason, no trial, no jury, nor a judge, only an executioner, and his name was Rislav Larik. He struck at Dorald's neck while proclaiming, Thou art no brother of mine, lopping his head from his shoulders. Combat, the traditional Kolovian way of settling an issue. King Rislav Larik was crowned on the spot, still wielding the bloody axe that cut the neck of his brother. His life was about to change, very rapidly. Emperor Gorius of the Elysian Empire, the very same emperor whose coronation Rislav attended at 13 years old, was understandably angry at the withdrawal of Skingrad. However, it is important to note that Emperor Gorius was no pushover. He was an accomplished warrior even before taking the throne, and his reign was scarcely peaceful, having to deal with rebellious vassals or border territories. Only eight months prior to the killing of Dorald had Gorius fought the High King of Skyrim, Kyorik the White, on the frozen fields of Sungard in the north. An Elysian army, like a flood of death, poured into the West Weald, expecting Skingrad to lay down arms and surrender at the Empire's grandeur. But Gorius severely underestimated the power of Clovian pride and tenacity. The book Rislav the Righteous does this next bit justice. Have a listen. Not surprisingly, the king wore the finest armor of his era, as the Colovian estates then had the finest leathersmiths in all of Tamriel. The king's Kilbanian mail, boiled and waxed for hardness and studded with inch-long spikes, was a rich chestnut red and he wore it over his black tunic, but under his black cloak. The winter rains had washed through the roads to the south, sending much of the west weald spilling into Valenwood. The Emperor took the northern route, and King Rislav with a small patrol of guards met him at a low pass on what is now the Gold Road. The Emperor's army, it is said, was so large that the Beast of Anaquina could hear its march from hundreds of miles away, and despite himself, the chroniclers say, he quaked in fear. Rislav, it was said, did not quake. With perfect politeness, he told the Emperor that his party was too large to be accommodated in the tiny kingdom of Skingrad. Next time, Rislav said, right before you come. The Emperor was, like most Elysian Emperors, not a man of great humor, and he thought Rislav touched by Sher Gorath. He ordered his personal guards to arrest the poor madman, but at that moment, the King of Skingrad raised his arm and sent his hawk flying into the sky. It was a signal his army had been waiting for. The Elysians were all within the pass and the range of their arrows. King Rislav and his guard began riding westward as fast as if they had been kissed by wild Kinnereth, as the chroniclers said. 
He did not dare look behind him, but his plan went faultlessly. The far eastern end of the pass was sealed by rolling boulders, giving the Elysians no direction to go but westward. The Skingrad archers rained arrows down upon the Imperial army from far above on the plateaus, remaining safe from reprisal. The furious Emperor Gorius chased Rislav from the Weald to the Highlands, leaving Skingrad far behind, all the while his army growing steadily smaller and smaller. In the ancient Highland forest, the Imperial army met the army of Rislav's father-in-law, the King of Kavach. The Elysian army likely still outnumbered their opponents, but they were exhausted, and the morale had been obliterated by the chase amid a sea of arrows. After an hour's battle, they retreated north into what is now the Imperial Reserve, and from there, further north and east, to slip back to nurse their wounds and pride in Nibane. It was the beginning of the end of the Elysian hegemony. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Rizlav Larek, the unexpected but heroic king of Skingrad, who faced an overwhelming army of the Elysian Empire who were hell-bent on bringing Skingrad to its knees. This was the fundamental event of Elder Scrolls history that cemented the Clovian Estates as an originally politically and culturally distinct federation. The Clovians would be the military strength and steadfast heart of Cyrodiil for many generations following, and the Clovian Estates would bear many famous heroes and few Future regents such as Bendu Olo, Emperor Riemann, and also Emperor Zero Kulakane. Aside from the great heroes came many everyday soldiers who still to this day continue to make up the bulk of Imperial Legion forces. All of this got started with Rizlav Larek standing defiant in the face of overwhelming odds. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope you now have a better understanding of how the Colovian Estates became such a powerful force in Tamriel, and why Rizlav Larek has a statue in Skingrad and is a symbol of pride for its citizens. Thanks again for watching, guys. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.